Tips and Tricks for Digital Wax Ups. First and foremost, I want to uh, thank everybody for being here today in the morning. And I want to always recommend you following us in our different social media platforms uh, in, on Instagram and on Facebook. Those are our main social media platforms. We also want to thank our sponsoring companies for allowing us to provide a one free CE credit for today's presentation. We have Coltein, Oral Arts, Romero Dental Seminars, and Dent Logics. Make sure to visit our webpage also, www.romerodentalseminars.com. At the end of our webinar, I would highly encourage you to visit, to visit uh, our webpage and make sure that you go in and you hit the CE quizzes link that you see on our webpage so that you can go ahead and download the CE quiz, complete it, and email it back to us at romerodentalseminars at gmail.com. We will then go ahead and submit this uh, for, to provide you with the one CE credit for today's presentation. We also want to highly recommend our YouTube channel, Romero Dental Seminars. And we also recommend that you subscribe and turn on that bell for notifications so that you get your instant notifications every time we upload a new video or any new content to our channel. Today, we have four very distinct learning objectives. Number one being identify available free software that can be applied to dentistry. Select an easy to use teeth library and learn how to manipulate them. Learn how to export the models and get ready for 3D printing and share a clinical case to exemplify each step. So let's get started with our tip and trick number one, the software. So there's, I personally use only two softwares, one being a free software, which is the one that I started using, which is Mesh Mixer 3.5, which is now available and it's free to download into your computer. Uh, I know that a lot of you are probably already using this software or are using even more robust, robust software. But, you know, if you're out there and you're not, you haven't just started doing any uh, digital design in your office, you know, this is an easy, inexpensive way to actually get started. And that's literally what I did. Uh, this was the first software that I got, you know, I got a hold of and I started playing with it. There's a lot of videos in YouTube on every single thing that you can think of in dentistry that you can use and learn to just identify and try to you know, manipulate some of your STL files that you will be able to import to this software. And again, the good the good thing about it is that it's free and it's you know you you can apply it for many different areas, but it has its own little dental applications. Uh, I would say that has and a lot of dentists using this software that has allowed, you know, people to go out there and record some videos and show us how to do just incredible things from aligners, you know, surgical guides, just regular uh, wax ups. And that's what we're going to get into today. We're just going to start out with something very basic because I just again, I think that there's so much that you can learn and it really depends on what kind of practice you have and how much you how far out you want to take this type of softwares within your practice. Now, there's other softwares out there that are more robust. And obviously, because they're more robust and they're specifically designed for dentistry, they require you to purchase them. And they're not they're not inexpensive. They're actually uh, uh, very expensive. It depends on how many how many computers you want to have attached in your office to this uh, specific software. But again, this software, the beauty of this one, it's specifically ExoCAD, is that it's specifically made for dentistry. I think it's one of the best softwares out there. It, ge it really gives you a lot of tools and integration with everything we do in dentistry. And, and personally, I don't, I, I, I use, we use ExoCAD in my in our office. Uh, and I'll show you a case where we use ExoCAD. We have a, a lab technician in the office that actually is the one that sits down in the software in the computer and manages all the software. So I personally don't have experience using the software, but I do have experience with the clinical applications of it, which at the end of the day is what we want to do in dentistry. I have more when I want to play with something and I want to try to do something myself. I just go ahead and use Mesh Mixer because in my it's easier for me. And I've, again, I've been using it for such a long time that it just makes it a lot easier and comprehensive for me to use. But this is just an example of very robust software that you can also have in your office. Uh, you know, either do it yourself or train somebody to help you. You know, get a lot of a, a lot out of this software. So my tip and trick number two is going to go to get into Mesh Mixer 3.5, which is, again, the one that you can, everybody that's here that hasn't had any experience with this can go just go ahead and just download it directly into their computer uh, as, a, as a free software. 
And the first thing I'm going to teach you is how to import the STL file and how to create and trim your base for your cast. And this is this is nice because again, we all like to see nice and clean cast. And if you when you import STL files into your into the software or you have them in your computer, normally they're kind of rough on the edges. And that's just because the way that you, you know, that you literally scan them out, you have areas that you, you know, areas that you really don't want to even have on, on the um on your STL, but they're there because you just gotta, you know, you just over overextended your 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 scanning. So it's really nice to have a really nice cast, just like we would have normally in dentistry. And this is just the easy steps. Once you're in your in, in mesh mixer, you go ahead and you hit that uh, import button. And once you do that, it's going to take you to your to your computer, any folder you have where you have your SEL files, and you'll download your SEL file. You can see that I have an SEL file here. This patient actually, this is a real case. You can see that she fractured tooth number ten, so I had scanned her, and I'm going to now go ahead and transform the cast. And what transforming means or it does for you is it just allows you to align the cast onto the software. And you can see that it was slightly tilted. So I went ahead and hit that transform button. Then I, I wrote, slightly rotated it. And now I have it more aligned. Now I'm going to go to the select feature. And in that select feature, I'm going to select the whole cast, make everything orange, just like you see it there. And I'm going to hit the extrude button. And the extrude button is going to help me just create a base. You can see that the direction is going to be on the y-axis and the end type is going to be on the flat. Then I'm going to hit the offset and I'm going to push it all the way to the right. And you can see how now I've created that base for this cast. Very, very easy to have a nice and clean cast. And you can do this for any case, you know, small cases, large cases. I'm just sharing with you a small one. Uh, I do, you know, we all do this type of dentistry every single day. Again, I'm going to the select feature. I'm going to select the whole cast. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go into the edit button. I'm going to go into the edit all the way up and I'm going to go ahead and say, hit flip normals. And what that's going to do is I'm going to start now creating a hollow cast. If you think about it, if you think about the mesh, all these, this, this mesh right now, it's all within that cast. And when I print this, I don't want to use a lot of resin. So I want to create, I want to make this cast hollow. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that it's nice and solid. And the first step you have to do is literally make the cast solid. Once you make that cast solid, then you're going to hit the hollow button. So it's now going to go ahead and remove any of that uh, uh, within the cast. It's going to remove any of the meshes so that you get you end up having a hollow cast. And, and I'm going to show you now how you make sure that the, the cast is hollow. So you're going to plain cut the cast after that. You hit the lower arrow. You're going to push that arrow towards the top. And now I'm going to rotate the model. And you can see now that there's the model is completely empty inside. So I was able to, in three different clicks, make this, uh, this model first a solid model, then a hollow cast, and then section or just trim the cast so that, again, you want to control the amount of resin that you're going to use at the time of printing the model. So always think about that. It's kind of like what we do in dentistry, right? When you're doing a dentistry, you pour a, you pour a model on an alginate tray or alginate impression, I'm sorry. You pour the model, you create a base, and then you have to trim that base in your model trimmer. Well, here you have to do the same thing. I like doing the same thing, but you want to keep this model hollow or empty with it in so that when you print, you use a lot less resin and it takes less time for you to print. So you always got to think about how do I'm going to end up having this model in my hands and that's through 3D printing. My next step is going to be how to, you know, just teach you really quickly how you wax up. And again, for you to be able to have to add some teeth to this model because Mesh Mixer is not a specific software for dentistry, you're going to have to have access to a tooth library. So the one that I would recommend uh, is uh, one created by Dr. Christian Brenes. I know Christian personally. Um, and if you go and visit that, that uh, uh, URL address that I'm giving you right here, www.digitaldentistryeducation.com, you will be able to download his library for free. And, you know, his library, he's got three different libraries, ones that are made out of Pontex. He's got, you know, teeth that are individual, teeth that are connected when you're going to do full archers. So it's it's very useful. Again, you if you've never used this, if you haven't used the software, you're going to have to play with it first. But this is an easier way because he's he's developed these teeth that are very, very anatomical and they are being very nice. So and, and there's and they're very easy to modify once you're in the software. And that's what I'm going to try to help you do right now. So actually, there's you have to import this these this tooth library within the mesh mixer. I already have them imported. You can see that I'm choosing it right there. I'm going to go down. I'm missing tooth number 10. So he's got a tooth number 10. And this is the Pontic library that I'm using right now. You can see that it's an ovoid Pontic tooth. 
So now, again, you're going to transform the tooth first, which is going to allow you to manipulate the tooth. You're going to be able to rotate the tooth. You're going to be able to bring it up, down. You know, once you drag and drop it into the software, into the mesh mixer, you can see that the tooth is way off of the area where the actual cast is. And you can see also that the tooth is highlighted. It's a different color than the cast. So that, that tells you that you are just manipulating that tooth. The cast is not gonna go anywhere. So you're gonna go ahead and you're gonna try to place the tooth and uh, orient the tooth in the cast within the best position. And now this is just coming down to dentistry, right? You know, when we're doing, you know, think about this. If you're gonna do this in an analog way, which I personally like waxing up with my hands, you know, for some people that haven't, that don't wax up at all, it takes a long time, right? It takes a, a good long time. And, and you really, sometimes you don't end up with a tooth that looks like a tooth. When you do it by means of a digital wax up, you have a tooth that Dr. Brennan's designed. It's a beautiful tooth. It looks anatomically correct. All you got to make sure is that this tooth fits well. You can see that I'm now, you know, hitting these tabs and pushing the tooth, making it wider, making it longer. All these small modifications are done directly onto the model. The one thing that I do want to let you know is that the more you play with the tooth, the more it can deform. So make sure that every time that you're stretching one side, you're moving the mesial, moving the distal, or moving, you know, making the tooth longer, make sure that you go slowly. Your increments are not that aggressive because if you do it too aggressively, you will deform completely the meshes that are building up that tooth. So you can see that I'm what I'm doing right now is I'm just concentrating on making sure that the tooth is at the right length, the right width, that the pontic is correctly located. This patient had a fracture lateral incisor, so I had a little bit of the root left on my scan. So I was trying to align the crown to the patient's actual existing root. If you don't have a, a, a tooth there, well, you know, you're just going to have to orient yourself with the neighboring teeth. And if you don't have neighboring teeth and you, this is a fully edentulous case and you want to, you know, fabricate a, 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 a denture for 3D printing. Well, again, that's when you, in my case, I would probably use a more robust uh, 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 software like ExoCAD. And I'm going to share with you a case with ExoCAD so that you can understand, you know, you know how, how much can you do with ExoCAD. But again, you're seeing me just kind of, you know, playing with the tooth. You can see that the mesial line angle is a little bit uh, too um, uh, uh, under contour. So I'm going to slightly make it a little bit larger. And you can, you have all these dials where you can hit and just modify the whole shape of the tooth. And again, it's so easy, so quick. Uh, you can always print overnight. You don't have to print just a single model. You, we normally see multiple patients in a day in our office. So you can print multiple things, uh, you know, multiple models or cast if you have, you know, two, three patients that you need to wax up, uh, you know, different things on for them. And I like doing this for composite veneers. And I'll share you a case with composite veneers. You can do it for class fours. You can do it for full missing teeth like the one that I'm showing you right now. You can actually do it for teeth that you're going to extract and then uh, you know, plan for implants, you can extract teeth within mesh mixer. There's a way that you can get rid of teeth within mesh mixer and then redesign your whole wax up. So there's, again, even though this is a free software, there's a lot of things that I've been able to do with my, for my own patients, you know, using this, this, this software. And it's, a uh, it's amazing that it's free and there's, and there's a lot of people out there. There's a lot of dentists out there using this software and they're just uploading videos on how to do so many things that we do every day in, in our our offices that again I would just highly recommend that you get into YouTube and, and go ahead and search for some of those videos. So now we're going to combine the meshes. Again, you want to think about this as being one mesh is your model, your SEO file for your model. A totally different mesh is the one that was created for the tooth. So what I have to do now is I have to make sure that everything becomes one solid color, one solid light gray color. As you would see initially, you can see on the right hand side, I have the object browser. You can see that that tooth, that single lateral incisor that I just waxed up is standing out because it's not part of the mesh at this point. So I got to make sure that I combine all this. And again, you select everything. And when you select things in Mesh Mixer, everything will turn orange. So you want to make sure that when you, you're selecting things, you want to select all of them at the same time. So you want to make sure that everything turns orange before you go ahead and combine your meshes. And I'm just, you know, taking my time here, go ahead and do it on the, you can see now that I've selected all, all the, all, both meshes that are there, I've selected them and I'm going to now create a face group and it's all going to turn purple. And then I'm going to go ahead and select again one more time. And then I'm going to clear that face group. And now everything is one solid color. So now I'm ready for printing. Now I'm ready to export. You can see that on the screen of, of Mesh Mixer, there's an export button down here. 
that's going to allow you to export that X, that STL file into your computer again. And then you can then bring or, or, or upload that STL file into your printing software. I use a very basic printer. And again, this, this is the, the completed wax up ready for me to export it. And I'm going to go ahead and export that to my printer. Uh, I just use a Photon S, a very simple printer, but you know, there's so many printers out there and I'm not going to talk about printers today, but you know, my, my, my printer, which is a very simple printer, it's a very inexpensive printer. It prints good enough for what I want to use it for a lot. I use it a lot for this type of cases. You know, I'm going to do class four veneers. I'm going to do mock-ups and I, 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 I use it for many of these cases and I just put it in my printer. And then I, you know, again, just, you know, using the software of the printer, import the model, put it in the printing bed and then send it to the printer and get it printed. It normally a model like this will probably take a couple of hours to completely print. And again, you, what you want to try to do is that you want to try to, you know, sure your model, make sure that it's not, that it's a uh, uh, hollow so that you take less time and less resin to print. This is the actual model came right out of the printer. It's a little bit rough on the edges. Uh, that's after removal of the base that I created for it, just to hold on to the, to the bed of the printer. Um, but you can see the lateral incisor is there waxed up and I'm ready just to go ahead and make a lingual uh, matrix impression of that to go ahead and restore that tooth. I'm not going to talk about the techniques that I use for this restorative, uh, for this particular case, but uh, I do have a webinar on fiber reinforced uh, 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 composites uh, where I show, I share this case completely. So if you want to know anything about how to fiber reinforce, you know, has severely broken down teeth, uh, make sure that you go and visit our YouTube channel and find that webinar and watch it. And you'll see the full, you know, the full step-by-step -step, uh, design and, and, and execution of this case. This is immediately after my restoration was completed. You can see that I've removed the rubber dam. There's a little bit, still a little bit of gingival inflammation, but you can see that the tooth actually looks like the tooth that I used to wax up. And I only really use the lingual aspect of that printed model, which is really the, the essence of, of a waxing. You just want, you just need the lingual surface so you can go ahead and build a tooth upon that. So uh, this is this is case number one. Uh, and again, there's other applications that you can have. I like using Blue Sky Bio for my implant guide design, and I still use Mesh Mixer. And this is another case that I have here to share with you just really quickly. This is a number 30 that is missing on one of my patients. She actually had a three-unit bridge. And the three-unit bridge, the, the portion had just chipped out of the pontic. So what I did is I sectioned the pontic. I left both crowns on number 29 and 31 for, for now. I, I, I made all three crowns later once I restored the implant. But for me, for me to plan the implant, I scanned the patient's mouth. I imported it, that STL file to Mesh Mixer, and using the same step-by-step -step protocol that I just shared with you, I went ahead and I added a wax up to number 30. You can see on the right-hand side, there is tooth number 30, it, it, again, just literally out of Dr. Brennan's library into the mesh mixer software, align the tooth, make sure that it's correctly positioned, you know, buccal cusp align, lingual cusp align, central fossa align. You want to make sure that you have it an anatomically well-designed and correctly located tooth. Once I do that, I, I, I mix all, again, I just, you know, combine all the meshes, export the STL file to the printing bed. I'm sorry, I exported it into my computer. And then I imported it into Blue Sky Bio. And using this digital wax up, I was able to design to say, okay, this is where I need my implant to be if I want the crown to be exactly in that position. So I was now using the wax up to plan an implant case and now be able to design a, a, um, a surgical guide. I actually, for this case, Again, I'm, I was fairly new at that time for, for this type of, of, of technologies, but you can see here on the left-hand side, I printed a pilot drill. I actually printed three guides for this patient, pilot drill, and then two more guides until the final drill. It was only three drills to get to the actual size of the implant. And there is uh, just the printed guides. As you can see them, they're right out of the, the, uh, the print bed of my, of my printer. And this is goes directly into the patient's mouth. I always test these and you can test them on a model. I, I literally tested them on a model, make sure that they were centered correctly, that the implant was going to be exactly where I wanted the implant. And then I went into the patient's mouth, use that surgical guide and very simply, you know, prepare the osteotomy and, 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 um, and place the implant. So, you know, there's so many ways that you can use uh, uh, this type of technologies in today's world. And, you know, a lot of people would say, well, hey, for cases like this, wouldn't you just do a free-handed implant placement? Well, you know, the answer to that, to that question is 
why not use a surgical guide when you're going to have less chance for error? If you're a younger dentist and you're just learning how to place implants, why not learn how to place implants with these with these guys that are more precise and that would give you you know less headaches during the surgical procedure? Now, yeah, this is a, a, a simple case, but when we have more complex cases where we're placing multiple implants, well, you know, e even more important to have a guide to make sure that everything is planned and executed in the best way possible. And the same way for for just regular restorative dentistry. You know, I'm, I, I use these wax up for prototypes. I use them for direct restorations. I use them from class four for veneers. And I'm going to share a couple of these cases with you so that you kind of understand, you know, what are the clinical implications of using or incorporating this type of technologies into your everyday clinical practice. And that's what's going to be my tip and trick number three. I'm going to start with my first clinical example. And in this particular case, uh, I'm not, again, I'm not going to go into the details of the case because I just want to share with you is how do we incorporate technology into this case. But just to give you a quick story about this case, tooth number uh, eight, uh, nine, I'm sorry, here in this patient, uh, you can see that there's a little fracture on the incisal ledge. That tooth was going to be extracted uh, due to internal resorption. Uh, uh, we were able to, you know, talk to the endodontist, you know, find out is, is there any way that we could, you know, try to prolong the life of this, of this tooth patient was very young, very, very young, high smile line, beautiful, natural teeth. And as you can see, because of that internal resorption, not only that was a problem, but the main problem was that she did have a composite that was at this point, not matching the rest of the substrate. But also if you look at the tooth, if you look at tooth number nine, the tooth is slightly more lingual. So the tooth is not aligned with not eight and 10. It's more lingual compared to eight and 10. So when I look at things like this and I know I can save teeth, and if you know me personally, you know that I'm a very conservative dentist, that I like saving teeth because I know how to save teeth. And I know that we have the means today in dentistry to save teeth, teeth that many people would think this needs to be extracted. You know, we have the means today to restore these teeth. And in this, this is one of these cases. So I went ahead, and again, if I take this side photo because I want you to look at the mesial line angle of number eight and compare it to the mesial line angle of number nine. You can see how lingual number nine is compared to number eight and even compared to number 10. So the beauty of this case is that right now, there's nothing I need to do. I, I don't need to prep this tooth. All I need to do is restore it. I just need to add composite so that I can go ahead and make both of these teeth aligned, eight and nine aligned correctly. And again, just looking at it from the gingival aspect, you can see that the tooth is definitely more lingual. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to scan. And you can see on the left-hand side, my scanned uh, model. I've imported that STL file to my mesh mixer. And the first thing I do, again, just clean the model, make it hollow, uh, you know, cut the plane, just make sure that you have a nice model. And then you start waxing up. Now, I again, I use Dr. Brennan's tooth library. And in this particular case, I have highlighted in red the, the, the amount of tooth from the actual digital tooth that I was using that was that was left after I completed my wax up. So you're seeing here is I'm adding I'm adding tooth structure and because you can rotate this model in multiple ways, I was rotating the model to see it from the incisal, from the gingival, from the left and from the right. All I wanted is to make sure that the line angles will match. You can see that I'm going to need to add composite to the tooth. I can tell that just by looking at the wax up. But most importantly, what I need to make sure that I accomplish is that the incisal edges, both eight and nine, match regardless of the incisal embrasure. And I'm saying that because if you look at Dr. Brenner's teeth, his incisal embrasures are slightly sharp. Well, that is not a problem because even though she has a rounded incisal embrasure uh, uh, on number nine, you can either just go ahead and use a little softness disc on your actual printed model and, and modify that before you make your lingual matrix impression, or you can just go ahead and fabricate your lingual matrix impression with a sharp line angle and then go ahead and reduce that in your composite directly into the patient's mouth. So that should not be a problem. And you can see here, I have now printed the model. I have printed the model of my wax up and you can see that eight and nine now actually align. They align. And the most important aspect, I want you to look at the photo on the right hand side, because this is very, very important. And I, and I tell this to my students and my residents when I was teaching all the time. The most important aspect of your wax up is that lingual embrasure. 
that lingual embrasure between eight and nine, because that is what you want to copy with your matrix. You want to make sure that your matrix has that lingual embrasure included so that you know exactly where that mesial contour of that tooth actually ends. So please keep that in mind. And that's one of the things that I like about, you know, using this software that even you know you, the, the quality of the model is very high. You have all these details that are going to help you provide excellent care for your patients. So now I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to isolate this case. I'm going to place my rubber dam and I'm going to put my rubber dam floss ligature there in place. And again, now everything is nice and isolated. I'm going to remove the previous restoration. I'm going to then smooth out any sharp edges left behind. I don't want any fracture, sharp enamel anywhere. I just removed the restoration again. As I said initially, this tooth needs no preparation other than removal of the old restoration. You can see now I'm using a soft flex disc just to go ahead and smooth any sharp enamel uh, 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 left over so that I make sure that everything is nice and smooth. I'm going to acid edge. I'm going to use a total edge technique. And because I'm etching uncut enamel, you want to make sure that you're etching your enamel for at least 30 seconds instead of 15 seconds. 30 seconds for uncut enamel. You go ahead, rinse. You can see that I have a, a mylar strip just to protect my neighboring teeth. I just want to concentrate on etching the actual tooth that I'm going to restore. And again, with a new mylar in place, I'm going to go ahead and apply adhesive. Now, in this particular case, I use OptiBon FL. And if you know OptiBon FL, OptiBon FL has a primer in one bottle and an adhesive in another bottle. If you have, if you're going to use something like that, like I use in this case, you only need to use the adhesive. There is no primer needed because there's no dentin exposed. This is all on enamel restoration. So that's what I'm going to do for this particular case. And I'm going to then go ahead and like here, this is the lingual matrix I, I fabricated using uh, a bite registration material. And I fabricated this copying the lingual aspect of that, the, the, uh, of the printed model. I'm going to apply my first layer of composite, which is going to be an enamel layer. I'm going to apply that onto the matrix. And I adapt it very nicely so that it follows the contours of my wax up. And then I'm going to take that into the patient's mouth. And you can see in this photo, which speaks volumes, you can see the very nice shape, anatomical shape of that lingual layer. It actually follows the anatomy of my matrix, of the wax up, because I'm applying the resin onto that matrix. And then I seed it into the mouth. Now, one thing that you have to keep in mind is that when you do something like this, you want to make sure that your composite literally overextends on the lingual it means that you want to have more composite than what you need because you need to bond to the lingual functional bevel that you created with your soft flex or with the burr. So you need to make sure that this is attached to at least one half of a millimeter to one millimeter of enamel on the lingual aspect of the actual patient. And you have to create space for that. So that's why you want to bevel the enamel, the lingual aspect of the enamel as well, so that you have room for this layer. And this is the way that you start. Now I remove my matrix and look at the anatomy. I mean, at this point, if I want to go in with a little soft flex this and just round a little more this embrasure, I'm more than, I mean, you're more than welcome to do. But I have a really nice rounded distal embrasure, distal lingual embrasure, which actually matches the distal lingual embrasure of the patient. So again, the idea is just to, this, this type of, 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 of dentistry, which can be analog or digital, I would say digital today because if you're not really good at waxing and you don't want to pay somebody else to wax it for you, which a lab is not going to do it for you for free, then make sure that you, you know, you have software like this. You can do it in your office. You can have somebody, you can train somebody in your office to help you do this and then go ahead and start, you know, working uh, on your cases. So now I'm going to go ahead and do my mamelons. I'm going to use dentin. I'm going to use intensifiers. I'm going to just recreate nature as much as I'm going to try to recreate what the patient has on tooth number nine as close as possible. And then I'm going to go ahead and just add my, my, my intensifiers. I add a little bit of gray translucent in between the mamelons. And then I'm going to do my final enamel layers, which I do it in three different steps. I do my mesial line angle or mesial mylar pull, the distal line angle, or distal mylar pull, and my facial increment. And again, I have a full webinar on anterior composite tips and tricks for anterior composites, uh, direct anterior composites. So please make sure that if you want to learn more about how I go about doing every single step for a, a beautiful composite veneer, uh, you can watch our, 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 our video, our, our tips and tricks video on that topic uh, in our YouTube channel. And again, if you have any questions in regard to our rubber dam isolation techniques, we have two full webinars on rubber dam isolation 
basic rubber dam isolation and advanced rubber dam isolation on our YouTube channel that I would highly recommend. All these videos are 100% free, so make sure that you share them with other colleagues as well. And again, once we're done with our final restoration, we go ahead and we just mark our line angles. And this is one thing that I like teaching because it's the best way to just maintain the shape of the tooth. You can see that I've, I have uh, uh, colored the line angles of their natural number eight, and I'm not trying to duplicate, duplicate exactly the shape of the tooth with those line angles on the my restoration, on my composite. And once you do that, you know exactly where to focus your finishing efforts. You don't need, again, if you do a good layering technique, there's very, very little finishing that you're going to be doing on your composite restorations. And that's really the way to go. Uh, and I'm not going to polish the, the, the inner proximal areas. For these inner proximal areas, I also highly recommend using very, very thin uh, um, um, finishing strips. This is... Um, this is one made by GC America called Epitex, and they come in four different uh, colors, and that you know, every color is a different grit, but they're extremely, extremely thin. You will not lose your contacts uh, when you use these strips. If you use anything like maybe like, I don't know, like a 3M finishing strip or something like that, you're definitely going to remove your contact. So make sure that you use something extremely thin so that you can keep that contact that you work so hard to accomplish. And again, I want you to see on the left hand side, if you look at this from the, uh, from the, from that view, you can see that no, both mesial line angles and distal angles are now even. They're at the right uh, uh, position and this is immediately after removal of the rubber dam. I don't have a photo, uh, a follow-up photo yet of this case, but you can see this immediately after the removal. There's a little bit of recession on the tooth because I place a cord and I put my rubber dam. But this is going to come down, and and you will see the composite just match the neighboring tooth, the neighboring teeth once these teeth uh, rehydrate again. And now I'm going to share my final tip and trick number four, which is now using a more robust software like ExoCAD. And I'm going to share with you a, a, a case that I just actually just did this case this past week, which is a, a new case for me. Uh, and, and I will certainly get this case to you uh, shown in another future webinar, maybe for next year, once we have completed the case. But for now, what I want to show you is the planning phase of the case and how you integrate all this your knowledge and all this technology together. Because again, technology is nothing without a good dentist. So dentistry, you know, I don't want, I, I personally don't feel, uh, I, don't, I don't feel that I am an expert in anything related to digital dentistry. I feel that I am knowledgeable enough to make sure that I can apply it in my patients, but I'm not an expert. Uh, uh, I, I wouldn't consider myself an expert in that field. I know there's a lot of people out there today that are literally experts in the field of digital dentistry. But don't forget that expertise is worth nothing if you don't have the quality, as the human qualities that a dentist should have, you know, being a good ethical dentist, but most importantly, having the skills in your hands and the understanding of biomechanical principles that need to be applied to everyday dentistry. And this is literally what this case is all about. You can see that this patient comes to me. He's got now excessive wear. You see this flat teeth everywhere from canine to canine. The patient has multiple restorations, multiple ceramic restorations that have been completed at the existing vertical dimension. The patient has a very deep uh, uh, overbite, but the most important thing is that his lower incisors are literally unexistent. He has literally eaten every single bit of them, and they're literally so small today that there's nothing left. And you can see the spaces in between the teeth just because he has worn down these teeth from every single aspect. And, and, and not to mention the canines. Again, I'm looking only at the anterior guidance first because we need to increase vertical dimension on this patient. I need to do that. And the patient needs to understand that, you know, this is going to be a full mouth case. But when we say full mouth cases, we immediately think about crowning every single tooth in the mouth. And I just don't see dentistry anymore that way. I don't feel that crowning every single tooth in the mouth is going to solve this problem. Because if you do that, you're most likely going to end up having to devitalize all those mandibular incisors. Uh, uh, you know, you, and, may, and probably even some other teeth uh, once you start prepping and removing the enamel. When you remove the enamel, you also remove the DEJ. So you, you are literally weakening teeth. You're making these teeth weaker. And I don't need teeth to be weaker. I need teeth to be stronger. So in my mind and following a lot of the biomedic principles that we have today that have been out there for 30 to 40 years or nothing new, maybe in the last 15 years, we have now made them, you know, we have, we've heard them more, but they've been out there for many, many years in ways that, that we have to understand that the more you preserve tooth structure, the better off you're going to be. So when I start a case like this, the first thing that I like doing is I like 
prototyping these cases. I like to to play some some uh, composite interim composite restorations in order for me to increase the vertical dimension with those interim restorations and make sure that functionally the patient is going to behave correctly. Functionally, he's going to be comfortable. He's not going to be clicking and popping of his joints. He's not going to have any pain or tenderness in his muscles. It's just going back and thinking about those principles that we know we need to have in dentistry. So again, this is a smile pre-op. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a face bow. I'm going to get a master cast of the upper and lower arches, a face bow, and I'm going to mount this. And I normally use uh, the Coy's face bow and my Panadent articulator to mount these cases. Initially, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start working analog. I'm going to go ahead and make just regular impressions with alginate. I'm going to go ahead and get a face bow, a centric bite record, and I'm going to mount this analog, all this information analog, into my analog articulator or the, my Panadent articulator. Once this this case is mounted on my panadent, and you can see from the uh, from the occlusal view, I just want to focus right now on the anterior guidance because that's the only area I'm going to restore to start with. I'm going to increase vertical dimension only on 12 teeth, six maxillary anteriors and six mandibular anteriors. And you can see here the amount of wear that, that he has in the lingual aspect of all his anterior teeth and in uh, mandibular teeth. Now think about this. If you need, if you were to prep these teeth for crown, what are you going to end up having? How much tooth structure do you think you're going to end up having? Literally very little to nothing. That's why there has to be a change in the way that we see these cases. So what did I do? I went ahead and I increased the vertical dimension in my articulator in, using the Panadent articulator. And I gave this, these models to uh, uh, our lab tech in the office. He then went and created this uh, putty matrix to stabilize everything at the new vertical dimension that I had chosen. I chose this vertical dimension. This vertical dimension was three millimeter increase in vertical dimension. As you know, there's many studies out there that have shown that if we increase vertical dimension all the way up to five millimeters, it's rare that your patients will have any uh, tenderness or, or, or clicking and popping of their joints. It's, it's something that it's, it's very usable. And, you know, from three to five millimeters is my range. This was only three millimeters. And I know that because I'm looking at my pin. I put the wax there. I'm sorry, the, the putty matrix. And once he does that, now he's going to digitize these models. So he's going to put the articulator in a lab scanner. And he's going to scan both models at the new vertical dimension. And that's what he's, he is going to import into the ExoCAD software. Now, I know I, I, I've never used them, but I know that there are articulators that you can use now virtually in ExoCAD. Uh, I'm not sure how to use them. I, I, I personally don't know how to use them. This was the, the lab tech's idea. He thought that this would be the best way for him to get good information. So that's why, why we did it. We went from analog to digital. We scanned and you can see that in the scan, within the software of ExoCAD, the increased vertical dimension is there. It's nice and stable and it's there. So now he knows exactly that he only needs to wax up for me from canine to canine, maxillary and mandibular archers. He's, he's, this is just a template that he just added to that. I, I didn't have an opportunity to take a photo of the computer wax up, but he can go ahead and move this up and down, make sure that he creates the contacts. And that's what he did. He created nice contacts everywhere, nice holding stable contacts. You can see how much he was able to increase the length of the of the mandibular incisors, all this in the digital wax up. Once he was happy and he had me check the occlusion, he went ahead and he printed models for me. And out of the printed models, I went ahead and I made clear PVS impressions. With the clear PVS impression, I went ahead and I acid edge prime and bond. I'm using now a, a flowable composite, flowable bulk fill, highly filled restorative material made by GC America, which is literally intended to do this more of an injectable composite technique. This is not the injectable composite technique. I don't, I don't like doing the injectable composite technique. I literally just, you know, apply, squirt the, the flowable composite within my PVS clear matrix and I seed it directly into the patient's mouth. I then remove the excess and you can see the immediate changes. We were able to lengthen eight and nine, seven and 10 and six and 11. Look how nice we were able to develop the cusp of the canines. And not only that we were able to do that on the upper arch, we were able to do that on the lower arch as well. And you can see this is him saying cheese. So he's got his, we know that he's got good phonetics. We have a conversation with him. Obviously the patient does feel different 
And the main the main aspect that they feel different is that there's nothing touching on the back. So there's only occlusion from canine to canine. And we can we can then go ahead and, and restore teeth on the back and give them full occlusion. In this particular case, I'm going to use a different technique. I'm going to use the dog concept, which is just allowing the up the posterior teeth, some of them to just over erupt and then intrude the front ones that are our higher vertical dimension so that we can establish a new occlusion. There's multiple ways that you can that you can finish and design this case. And this is not what the lecture is about. What it, what it is about is how do I use technology to get to this point? And this was a lot faster than sitting down and waxing up 12 teeth. As you can see, the front, the maxillary anterior teeth had very little to no wax on the facial aspect. It was more on the lingual. The lingual was where he had eroded or, or, or uh, much of his enamel. That's where he was missing tooth structure. So now when I'm thinking about how am I going to restore this case once I transfer him to final restorations, well, guess what? I'm going to do lingual veneers. I don't have to do full coverage crowns. I can do lingual veneers. I can, and, and with that, just add the material where he needs to add it. So there's many, multiple ways that you can do this uh, in a very conservative way. If you think about the mandibular incisors, I've created more height. I've created more room for them. So now if I were to prep those teeth for crowns, well, guess what? They're already prepped. I don't need to even touch them with the burr. I just need to create a little finish line so that the lab knows exactly where my finish line ends and fabricate the new restorations at the new vertical dimension. So not only that I have been able to create space for the future restorations, but I'm also right now test driving the new vertical dimension in relationship to the centric location of his condyles. And again, that's basically what occlusion is about. And that's how we, I think that we should be working on these cases. And this is how you can today use these two technologies, you know, analog and digital and understanding of dentistry to make cases like this come together. And that was my last slide of my presentation. I want to thank everybody for being here today.